Well, hello everybody. This is Dr. Will Wheat, and uh, we are on what I would call part two, maybe even part three, is an issue uh, becoming fully human. And this part is mainly uh, for the purpose of explanation. I, I realized um, after Sunday's two messages that I did on this particular topic that there is a need for explanation. Uh, explanation and where the come from is coming from and so I decided to do a little bit of what I believe uh, clean up our explanations um, um, segment today on this Wednesday Bible study so my mindset goes into how did the uh, penal substitution conversation even get started and I am of, of the full persuasion <clears throat> How we see and view Genesis 1, uh, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and Genesis chapter 3, how we perceive uh, those three chapters and how we give explanation is how we come to our conclusion that the penal substitution theory is valid. So what I wanted to do was uh, a question and asked all of us to consider another point of view, another perspective. So, so then you come out, I come with, um, and I've been talking about this with our congregation for a while. A um, long time ago, I started, de I deal with a series that had to do with um, the polytheism coming to monotheism, meaning that how do we go from uh, uh, many gods to believing in just one God? What was the process of time? I talked about the fact that many, many, many in the early history that a person found his identity in his community or in his tribe. And that's where he, he's, he prospered, that's where he got his ideology, that's where he, he found uh, a God to worship. And how in that community, if, if, if a particular personality began to evolve, and if that family or personality evolved and then if um, their crops spoiled or if there was war or something of catastrophe would happen, they would take that person of individuality and sacrifice him. And then that peace would come and come over to that colony. And then they would find peace. We also talked about how uh, Israel, the Israelites were in captivity in Babylon. And in Babylon, there was, because they had a crusade to conquer the whole world, there were many different tribes, many different cultures in Babylon, much like there are many different tribes and cultures here in the United States of America, and a lot of belief systems, and a lot of belief systems and theology on how all of this came about. The major theology at the time was Enuma Elish, and I believe that Genesis, and, and prior to this, in the books that was written, Genesis was not even written uh, as far as the records go, um, the five Pentateuchs. But Genesis come about and being talked about to uh, the bulk are to give another consideration to the uh, Enuma Elish theory about how man was created and he was created because of, of uh, man comes from these gods. And one was fresh water, one was water um, that was troubled and um, uh, chaotic, which was Tiamat. And, we, and Tiamat overslayed um, uh, the uh, I can't think of his name, the freshwater god. And then Marduk was created to destroy Tiamat because of her violence, and from that came the creation of man. And man was to serve the gods. Well, the Hebraic mindset wanted to bring uh, a, a clear understanding of this and began to talk about creation. We discovered, and I shared with you, that Genesis chapter 2 is older than Genesis chapter 1. And what I saw in Genesis chapter 2 is the narrator not particularly uh, talking about the fall of men and, and how um, we get into the predicament of sin and curses and evil um, as we now are experiencing in the world, that in that study they're talking about the development of humanity. In that study it's showing you that humanity was, even though Adam ish and Ish, Isha, Eve are created, they're created in infancy. Humanity is an infant, and God is bringing them along. And in bringing them along and understanding, there's a process that takes for them to grow into sonship, 
for them to grow into partnership where they are co-rulers with God. And so, but there's a process because they're infants, they would uh, have to be brought along uh, um, gradually. But the scriptures don't point that out. When we read the scriptures, we think that Ish and Isha, Adam and Eve, are fully grown, fully aware, and have full knowledge of what's right and wrong. That's not true. So when we look at the way that the orators were dramatizing this story and telling it, especially starting from Genesis 2, it shows you the conscious and unconscious development of man. How man, uh, and using the serpentine symbol, uh, the Euboros, that, that is a symbol of the serpent, and that's, that serpentine symbol comes from the, the Egyptian background. So instead of a circle or a ring, the circular serpent was used, and the serpent was swallowing its tail. It was used significantly because they wanted to talk about how it was all, everything was all in one, all inclusive in this circle. In this circle, it created, it impregnated itself. Everything and explanation was given about time and the process of time and, the, and nature and everything that happened in it. That was the Egyptian uh, viewpoint. But this Egyptian viewpoint gradually uh, was translated over to a Greek mythology. So I wanted to give a little background about that. I wanted to talk about the orator that's talking about this serpent speaking to Eve did not have the same equation that we have that the serpent represents Satan. Because the conversation of Satan was not even thought of at this particular time. This all had to do with the maturation, the maturing of man, how man come into existence, how, how we are developing and how God is bringing us into a full aged uh, a participant with him as his son. And not only are we ruling in heaven, but we're ruling in earth. And when we rule on earth, he is ruling with us. We rule it in heaven, we are ruling with him. So this is a partnership, this is all inclusive. But there's a method and a process by which all of this is brought together. And we see this process to the best of explanation by the, wind, the wise men of that period. So you have these wise men talking about the unconscious becoming conscious. What would cause this wholeness, this circle to break, to break and then for the serpent to loose its tail and to speak, what would cause that? And that's the prohibition. That's what we talked about on Sunday. It's the prohibition. It's, it's the prohibition that God put in front of man, thou shalt not eat of this tree. And that tree is there purposely. And we don't know. We just know how it's written down. But let's consider that Adam is set into this garden, and, they, and he's told in this garden that he can partake of any tree, all of this, uh, every tree in paradise is his. He can take of it. And, and so he's enjoying paradise. He's, he's enjoying the freedom of having everything as his own. And as a toddler, enjoying a room full of toys and exploring and, and finding out what each toy can do and how there's pleasure that each toy brings to that, that child, that, that infant, that toddler. And it's a different type of pleasure, but it's all pleasurable. So now, there, but there's a sense of no, not having a playmate, not, no one to share this joy, this pleasure with. So now in Genesis 2, you see God create animals and all the creatures that he created. He brings before Adam. And Adam, or Ish, gives names to each one of these creatures. And every name that he gave to these creatures, God did not change its name. But yet, the sense of loneliness and being alone still existed with Adam. The still, it was still there. Nothing really changed. So then the scriptures leave over a lot of things that could have been done and left and leave to our own imagination and our own consideration. And so as the story goes, then God put Adam to sleep. And putting him to sleep, he took from inside well, Isha, our woman, our female, and presented Isha our woman, our female, to Adam. And this was, oh man, a great excitement and a completion, the aloneness. Remember God said it's not good for man to be alone. The aloneness is answered in a reflective relationship. Someone's eyes look like 
theirs, someone's being that is the same as theirs, but yet distinct. This is the excitement that Adam saw. He says, now this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and was presented uh, to the world. And, and notice it says, and they were naked. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. So they, man and woman, uh, was naked and not ashamed. And I, I, I try to draw an example so those of you who are listening to me can follow the thought. So the example is two toddlers, a male and female toddler, out playing. And they don't have any clothes. As long as they're toddlers, not being clothed and not being naked don't mean anything to them. They're innocent because they, they don't have no distinction, no, no, uh, nothing telling them that there is really a difference. They're the same. They don't really recognize you boy, I'm female, and, and we don't supposed to be naked together. But there has to be some information given to each one of the children, each one of the toddlers that will help them uh, mature and recognize their distinction or their distinctiveness from each other. And as they take in this information, they take in the world, they begin to grow into their self and self-consciousness, and now they begin to ask questions. Now curiosity uh, begins to flood in that was never there in the beginning. Same thing is happening with this, this issue, Isha. They are, they're, they're developing the voice, um, that inner voice, what I call the ego, is developing the, that unconscious self is, is, is becoming more conscious of its awareness and its surroundings. And so as, as it becomes that way, it asks the question about God and the relationship they have with God. Did God say? And now that prohibition, that tree in the midst, becomes to be suggested as something that's being withheld from them that would cause them to be equal to God in image and likeness. There's some knowledge being withheld from them that would make them equal to God. And so now they begin to consider themselves as someone or something less than God. You never reach out uh, for uh, another being's ownership unless you think what that being has is something that you need, something that's lacking inside of you. So these questions create a sense of lack. Now notice that the, the narration could be God giving information about his creation about man. But when this reaching out takes place, this taking of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil takes place, the narrative and the narrator change. It's not only God talking about man, and his, pers his perspective about man and his relationship with about man and what man is to him, it now becomes the narrative, the narrator and the narrator becomes man and his perception about God and his relationship with God. So when, when, when God in this story, in this illustration, is coming into the garden at the cool of the day, the, 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 the cool of the day is the first hint of, or one of the hints of being man being in his sensory realm and not in his spiritual realm. Because in the sensory realm, you, you pay attention, you pay attention to temperature, you pay attention to the time of day. You, you, all these things come, all these things come into the component of your assessment and judgment of how things are. So when God says, "Where are you?" then the answer, pardon me, then the answer is, "I see." No sound. Excuse me. Okay. Here's my sound. There's everybody's down. Where's me? Oh, I got this upside down. Where's my sound? Oh, there it is right there. Boop. I'm sorry. Then the answer becomes now, now hopefully there's some explanation. I don't have to go over everything I just said. <laughs> But what I was talking about, what you did not hear, had to do with my explanation of how we're talking about the formation, how we come into our realization of being fully human. It was always God's intention for us to be human. And, and how Genesis chapter 1, and I'm going over that narrative again in case you didn't hear it by way of Zoom, uh, it was always God's intention that we be fully human so that we could both reign in this realm on earth and also in heaven. God wanted us to be co 
rulers with him in the seen and the unseen world. And so, the, but at man, when he's coming, Adam, which is Ish, Eve, Isha, when they are formed, they, they represent and they're the archetype of humanity. Humanity was in its infancy. And because humanity was in its infancy, um, then you could not, God had to have a process to bring them from that infancy into full maturity. And we have hints of this uh, in, other, uh, in other scriptures. For example, there's in scripture that talks about the law and why it was given. The law was given, okay, the rules and regulation was given as a schoolmaster, okay, for us until we, we grew up and became of age. And then when the, we become of age, we no longer need the law because the Christ mind had been manifest and is now our consciousness. So because we have the Christ consciousness, we don't need the law any longer. Paul also hints at this when he says, when he says in, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, that when he was a child, he talked as a child, he behaved as a child. But now that he's become a man, he's put away childish behavior, childish words. And now he's, he's, he's responding as a responsible person, able to make quality judgments because he's now grown up to have the mind of Christ. He also says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ, who was in the form of God, and did not think it robbery to be equal to God, but became obedient. He humbled himself and became obedient. So obeying God and letting God be your guide is right for you until you reach the proper age of maturity where God hands your kingdom over to you because he's, he's, he's mentored you, he's coached you, he's guided you, and he's see and has made the evaluation. You're spiritually mature and emotionally mature to handle the responsibility of leadership or rulership or whatever you want to say. But you see this process in Genesis chapter 2, in, in, in how the, the orator, the storyteller, is drama, given the dramatization of God's relationship with man. I talked about toddlers and how they were both naked, Genesis 3.25, and yet was, was unashamed of it, like two toddlers, boy and girl know nothing about sexuality, know nothing about the differences or the distinction, are playing with each other, new to uh, dress. No big deal, don't mean nothing. But as they grow into their individual lives, they become more individual, I'm sorry, in, more individual, their personalities are more distinct, their sexuality is more become distinctive, and their differences is more knowledgeable. They become curious and they ask questions about themselves as well as each other. That is the maturation that's happening with this man and this woman, these two earthlings, they're growing up. And so before, everything was the same, all in one. All was the same, there was no different. They were part of all of creation. But creation. But when they started seeing these distinctions in themselves, they began to ask questions about what other things that may be different from them. The same thing is true. So when you have the symbolism of the serpent, the Euroboros, the, the serpent eating his own tail. The question comes when they're telling the story, what makes this serpent release his tail and speak? The serpent represents our unconscious becoming conscious of itself. That's all it is. There's no demon. It's not about Satan. It's not about good. It's not about bad. It's about how man is now questioning and it's God's purpose that man questions. It's God's purpose that man grows up and put aside the rules and regulations and take on the mind of Christ because he's been obedient, he's, t he's, he's, he's gone through the process, he's matured, he's maturated to the point where God can entrust him with all the kingdom of God, with all creation, and he can rule it. That was God's plan. So in this story of Genesis 2, that's trying to give an explanation of what God's plan was and how we usurped that plan by jumping ahead of God before it was our time. But anyway, so the serpent is speaking to Eve. It's, it's a thought, it's not an outward conversation because if this is an outward conversation, then it probably would have been some kind of uh, uh, um, um, resistance to this 
and, and, and skepticism to this outward creature trying to tell her what God intent was when it's, it's a creation under its authority. So the serpent only represents an inward conversation. And Adam must have been having the same conversation because once she took of that fruit and gave it to him, he ate as well. So that, that says he must be having the same thought process. And their eyes was open. Up to this point, the narrator is God giving his explanation about his relationship with man. When they partook of this fruit, things changed. Their eyes were open. And now they can see not only spiritual things, they can see themselves in the natural. Here's something we don't consider. Man, humanity was always human, always in a body. The body was, they were always naked. And they never appreciate the, the fact that they could not only live but could die. They never appreciated or even considered death. They just considered being alive. Being alive. They, keep, they didn't even have a sense of death, the end of their mortal bodies because of their spiritual reality. So when the eyes are open and fear comes in and there's a sense of something I did wrong, because I did this out of time or out of step, it's the same way that children act. We see this played out in our own household every day. We have toddlers, they're infants, they, they grow up into toddlerhood. They, you say, don't touch this, don't go there, don't do that. They do it anyway. When they do it, they hide. Like, don't take that cookie. They take that cookie off the counter anyway, and they eat it. And you say, did you have a cookie? They hide, they lie about it, they hide the cookie or the evidence of it. So, because they don't want to be discovered, there's a sense of, of fear that the person that gave me that gives me life and makes provision for me has always also put limits on me and I cross that limit without permission maybe they're going to react toward me in a negative way they don't know so the same thing with Adam and Eve they didn't know so they hid themselves and so when Adam where are you how come you're not here on your spiritual level where we always communicate and Adam says well I heard you I heard you walking in the garden you heard me walking in the garden you know, and I was, and we were naked, so we hid ourselves among these trees. Who told you? Who told you about this distinction of you being naked? Who told, did you do, did you reach for that tree that I told you not to eat of? Apparently that's it. You've taken into yourself some knowledge and information. You're not ready. You're not ready for this knowledge and this information. And now we find man doing the thing that all mankind do when they fall into fear. They blame it on somebody else. They don't take responsibility. And they also blame God. Well, it was this woman that you gave me. So not only is he blaming the woman, but Adam is blaming God. This is his development of being human. But God knew this was going to happen. This was not was a surprise to God. And so God turns to the woman. Woman, what is it that you've done? What is this that you've done? Well, it's this serpent. It's this creature. It's this thought, this is this inner thought that you gave us, this consciousness that you gave us. It, it, it spoke to me and, and told me not to do it. And I, I followed that conscious thought and I reached out and I gave it to my husband. And then, then, then to that consciousness that was there. You know, you know, things are changing for even that consciousness. Things are changing for that consciousness that we call the serpent. And then God goes on and began to say, because you've done this, to the woman. You are going to give birth. And in this birth, you're making a quality decision. Your desire is going to be your husband. You're going to desire to have children. And in that child birthing, there will be pain. He's not cursing them. He's telling them what happens on this level where you can make decisions, where you are not asking God, is this good? Or asking God, is that bad? But you're looking and you're estimating with your own estimation whether something is good or bad and should and you're making quality decisions for yourself that's why we get into the bible and it tells us to acknowledge our ways to submit all our ways to god to acknowledge him to lean not to our own understanding that is telling us we're not mature enough we're not even though we've had experience in this life though we had coaches in this life god is the ultimate teacher don't lean to your understanding acknowledge god then we have Jesus as our architect who said, I never do anything that I haven't seen my father do. I never say anything that I haven't heard my father say. 
And because he was obedient even to death, God elevated him and crowned him and set him at his own right hand to rule over all of his creation. All of that we see in Christ is, is what God had intended for the first man and woman that to maturate to that position of sitting at his right hand. So we still been positioned in Christ. Right where we were before, we reached out and grasped. Now, a lot of people call this the fall because they, they, have, they have strategically placed Genesis 1 before Genesis 2. And in Genesis 1, it comes out as though uh, God is perfect. God created mankind in this world perfectly. And because man was created in perfection, that uh, he, he violated that in Genesis 2, and he fallen from the grace and fallen from paradise, and, he, and we're trying to get back to paradise, trying to get back to heaven. Well, doing that, you miss a lot of things in Genesis 1. Genesis 1 came after Genesis 2, originally purposefully, because it wanted to, sh it wanted to give you another point of view, not just the Yahweh's view, but the Elohim, the priest's view, was is more cosmetic and not phys uh, physical. It had to do with the plan of God and the fact that in Him is beauty and creativity. Because we always, uh, looking at Genesis 1, we really leap over verse 2 to verse 3. But verse 2 is the answer to the popular Numa Elish uh, fable and mythology that was populated in, in Babylon when the Hebrew children uh, or Israel was in captivity. And they gave that explanation to debunk that conversation. So it talks about chaos and chaotic waters in Genesis 2. It lets you know that in the beginning was God. Amen. And it talks to you about how the Spirit of God hovered over the chaotic waters. There was void. That means there was chaos. Instead of God speaking to that chaos, he drew near to those chaotic waters and hovered in silence. He hovered over those chaotic waters in silence. And in doing that, he was causing chaos that has no form, no frame, to see the great possibilities in itself. To see that there is no need for, for unformed direction. But in you, there is something beautiful and, and great possibilities in the chaotic form. And so as this began to come to the surface of chaos, then God speaks. Then God speaks. But before he speaks, he hovers and draws near. That's one of the reasons I believe that we're encouraged not to judge anyone, but to draw close, not to judge with our speech, but to grow close and to look deep within the chaotic waters, deep within the person and personality that is troubled, and see the possibility and the frame that is hiding under that disturbance. If we do that, if we allow God to work through us, the light that's in that darkness will begin to break through that darkness and shine. No darkness has ever put out the light. And that's what we have to see. We have to not see people or the world with our natural eye. We have to see people and the world with our spiritual eye. And that's going to take purpose. And if we take purpose to see the person, to show them their, their possibilities, their creativity, to show them that there is form and direction inside of them, they will come out of that darkness into his light and dwell in the harmony of God. It's about harmony, relationship, reflectiveness, growth from abundance. I do not want to take my leadership and my perspective from a fallen mindset that feels that it's lacking and missing something and now God is angry because if I take my leadership from that, then I'll believe in the punitive uh, punishment of hell and damnation and I'll preach for a substitute and God needs to be appeased because he's angry and so forth and so on. But when I see this from the original orator's mindset, what the message was supposed to be before Constantine got involved and all these other religious philosophers got involved, but what God was saying through these wise men and these men who were uh, shown this by way of revelation 
and needed to search their vocabulary to tell the story that God has placed in their heart. When I see that, because the Holy Spirit is bringing me to and you to that same that same opening open eye understanding, and that's why the teaching is: if you see yourself properly, then you will not see the problems that you think you have. You'll see the solution. You'll find the strength and the energy to set off the negative if you see that you're not missing or lacking anything. So in Christ, all your need is met. In Christ, you can be content knowing that God has answered every problem, that you have the answer to it, that the problems really don't exist because you are the solution and the savior of your salvation. I'm sorry, the savior of your situation because salvation lives in you and will never leave or depart from you. So that's the thought process. That's the way, the reason why we're taking the, the, this step of faith to teach this lesson that doesn't sound like every other lesson. And we hope that you stay tuned, that you stay around, you stay connected until the explanation is fully explained to your understanding and you reconsider the fact that Christ and in Christ, you have all your need met. There's no failure in him and there's no failure in you. God has plans for your life and none of those plans include defeat. That's the truth. Well, I'm looking at my clock and I'm way, 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 way out of time. So we're going to stop there. But I thought I needed to give a little explanation about this so that, that uh, as the Spirit of God opens these, this thought to me and I begin to share this with you, at least you can track where I'm coming from. You may not agree with me, but at least you know. He shared with me why he's thinking this way. He shared with me his objective, what he's after. Let me listen. Maybe I can see. Maybe I understand. Maybe I might even agree. But it's all right if you don't, because God loves you and me. Amen. And I love you. I love you. And I'm just believing that if we stop projecting conflict, hardship, stop believing in an adversary and a devil, we will not project contradictions in our own personal life. That's what we're after. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your tithes. Thank you for your offerings. Thank you for going to www.nccfc.net and leaving a, hitting that, that donation tab and leaving us a tithe offering or a gift of love. Thank you for uh, writing your checks to the New Creation Christian Faith Center and enveloping that check or money order to uh, 2851 West 120th, excuse me, 120th Street, Suite 522, uh, Hartland, California. 90250 or using Zelle. You just go into your Zelle account and pulling out your tithes, your offerings, your gifts of love, and addressing that Zelle to sisterweed at yahoo.com. We are receiving it. Now, as far as the pandemic is concerned and us not meeting together, uh, we got to follow the government. The governor says that we should not gather because there has been a spike in cases. And uh, so we want to do what is suggested that we do so that we don't add to it. I said this before, I said it again. For those of us who are strong enough that the pandemic won't even bother us, we still have to uh, comply to the government lead so that those whose faith is not as strong as ours will not try to imitate us without the, the proper faith. So the strong must in, um, bear the infirmity of the weak. So let us follow suit, though we are strong in faith, though we don't fear no pandemic, but for those who are not as strong in faith, they can follow us and they can stay safe. All right? Until Sunday morning, this is Dr. Will Wheat, and I'm, uh, I'm saying to each and every one of you, remain safe. Thank you for your attentiveness. Replay this video again and talk about it. See you Sunday. God bless.